to first of all thank you, Vanguard Communications, for having the foresight to do something like this, to offer thoughts and knowledge and, and maybe a different way to look at business uh, to your clients and, and others. So I really appreciate you doing this for your clients. And by the way, I've invited a few people as well, so I hope some of my, uh, my grandmother hopefully is listening and, and what have you. So I, you know, I reach out to my list and my grandmother was on it, so I'm hoping she's on. But uh, welcome to my folks as well that might be listening. And then this, the second part of that is kudos to you, the listeners who take time out of their very hectic day to listen and learn from people perhaps that are out doing something uh, that might be instrumental in helping your business maybe get to the next level. So I commend you for taking the time to do things like this and, and we're all going to learn something together. And uh, again, I really appreciate you being here. A couple of things I do want to mention. I do teach at the University of Denver and I may actually use some of the things that I do at the University of Denver, non-academic that is, but maybe some anecdotes that I use with my students. So I might use that as a reference as I go through this. And then one last piece is I've just joined forces with EMeth International, EMeth International. And I'm not sure if the audience has heard of EMeth or EMeth Revisited. I'm going to throw this out to everyone. It's a really good book, EMeth Revisited. It's written by Michael Gerber. It's written a number of years ago. I think they've sold 7 million copies of this book thus far. And it's, it's a great read on how to grow a business, and I would highly suggest it uh, to all the audience. And I think you can get it on Amazon for, I don't know, 3 or $4. So it, it's well worth the $5, $3, whatever the case may be. So um, one thing I would love to uh, uh, share with you as well is some of the, the things that we do at EMeth is, and you may have heard these lines before as well, and it's, we're famous for the working on the biz instead of in the biz, uh, helping owners get their life back, some other things. One thing that really stands out for me is our job is really, and this is going to be somewhat indicative of my talk today, is having your business on your terms. And that's really what I want to impart today is to have business on your terms. And maybe another way to say it is, does your business work for you or is it the other way around? So with that, we're going to start our, our program here. It's about cultures of co collaboration. And it's really about somewhat of a blueprint to understand what, um, where you may be and where you might want to get to. The five ingredients that go into this are, of course, the cultural piece, which I'm going to talk a great deal about, leaders, how they impact culture as well as people, and, of course, process and metrics. The first three typically drive the last two, so I'll probably I'll spend a lot more time on cultural leaders and people than I will process and metrics, but understand they are certainly important, but typically they are driven by the cultural, the leaders, and the people component. So let me run through the agenda real quickly. It's who is this guy? We've kind of talked about it. I am going to run through a little bit about what I do and why I do what I do, how I do it, and um, give you a flavor for that. I will certainly impart a lot of thoughts around culture. I've got several questions, five being the main ones, but I'm going to ask you a ton of questions. And then, uh, of course, our Q&A at the end. So again, thank you for uh, joining me. and. Um, I do want to start my cultural talk about many years ago, I'm going back to the mid 70s and yes, I am that old. Back in the mid 70s, when I first began my career, I was in charge, a, um, I worked for a manufacturer and my job was to go into retail stores and work with the store personnel to educate them on our product. The idea, of course, the more they knew about my product, the more of my product they can sell. My charter was I needed to go to the back of the store and meet with the store manager to make sure he understood why I was there. So this cultural journey I'm on was I determined early on what kind of reception of the person I would meet, that personality at the back of the store, and typically they were up above the store. I know you know the, the context. They look through those two-way mirrors kind of creeping away. But I knew exactly what kind of person I was going to meet when I went back to meet the manager by just walking through the store and understanding how people reacted to me, the salespeople within the store, if the store was dirty, if the parking lot wasn't kept 
etc. I knew I'd probably have a bad situation in the back of the store. When I walk in, I was greeted very, very happy people, productive people. It seemed like they were engaged. I would go back and have a very good experience with the manager typically. And it was really interesting how that store, this microcosm, took on the persona of the manager. And this really started on my cultural mission. And, uh, and here we are today, many years later. What I want to deliver today is, is really um, context. I have some content, but I want to deliver context. And um, uh, away we go. And I do, I have a picture of myself years ago. I remember I, I told you I started this a long, long time ago. Um, so I, I'm going to share a picture with you when I first began my journey, uh, which was, like I said, quite some time ago. So I've been at this a long time, and that picture illustrates that. Let me tell you a little bit about what we do, and this might be indicative of your organization. Over the years, and I've worked with a lot of businesses as a business coach, uh, business advisor, executive coach, et cetera, I work with a lot of businesses that over time have morphed, and they start out very pure, very simple, but over time they begin to morph, and they start to look like this. This is a communication uh, issue, who does what with who, how do we do what we've done where we've always done it this way. And often I walk into in almost any, well, let me say every organization I've walked into, this is typically what I find. And it's not, this is not a negative comment. It's just, I have the power of the helicopter view of an organization. So my job, of course, is to, to create something like this. It's very linear. It has a flow to it. There's a process flow and it's very orderly. And that's not always the case, but I, what I'm trying to illustrate is how a business can morph out of its own bounds at times and how someone like myself has to come in and create these process flows and this linearity of the business. So one of the questions I ask my students in this very example is, if it's simple, but what if from an organizational perspective, we eliminated all the departments so we just thought of ourselves as one big company? So we're not the HR, we're not the sales department, we're not finance, we are just one big ubiquitous we're here to get the job done company. It's a rhetorical question you have to answer yourself. And then the second question I pose to my students is what if we didn't have any titles within our organization? That would be interesting. And again, there's no real answer. I just want you to think about it. I work, when I teach at DU, they're master's level students. They're mid-career people. They usually come out of very large organizations. And I love to ask the questions because it becomes from what is, what exists, and what could be possible. So it's just a way to think about the business as well. The first part of really where we get into is my job is really to understand or either align or realign organizational energy. It's re-energizing people, it's reigniting purpose, and it's re-engaging the passion. So I have yet to see a business started where people aren't passionate about what they do. They want to create a dynamic business, they may want to make money, they want to have perhaps a legacy at some point, they want to pass the business on to their, their children, whatever the case may be, there's passion that comes uh, into this. And it's my job to help business owners, company executives reestablish that passion. So that's kind of what I end up with. Um, and it's just an overview of how we do it, where we go, and really just one simplified way to do it is to think about my job is to help an organization it's, assess itself. Where are you now? Where do you want to be? Pretty simple. And then we look at the gap. What's the gap between where we are today, which is the alignment piece, and where do we want to be in the future? And then, of course, once we do that, it's to orchestrate the process. How do we accelerate and orchestrate the process? So it's really that simple. The, uh, here's my world. This is where I, I look, and this, this is where I really want to spend a little bit of time as well. If you look at the diagram on the right side, you'll see my five bullets that surround the customer experience. And by the way, customer is, I use this with my healthcare management master's students because what I want them to think about when I think of customers is radically successful businesses. I am not a clinician. My job is to help create a radically successful business. The examples I use are radically successful businesses that have already done it, and we use the word customer. So if you see that a great deal, I've interjected some patient vernacular within the presentation, but it's really about business. So that's where I'm coming from with this. 
We start with the organizational culture piece, which is at the very top bullet. We get around to the right side with the highly capable leaders, engaged people, effective process, measured outcomes. These things surround the customer experience and feed into the customer experience. My little bullet on the left side is all organizations are perfectly aligned to achieve the results they are getting. One of probably one of the best statements I've ever heard. And what we find is when I work with business leaders or business owners is, and so are you. So it's the idea of we are the business. We have to internalize the business and we create the culture around the business. One, one thing I, I saw a t-shirt the other day. I love the t-shirt. It said, you run your business like you run your life. And for some, that's an aha moment. For me, for example, that was an aha mo moment. It's like, wait a minute. Could I do this better? So it's the idea of the um, how do we build a customer-centric organization or a patient-centric organization? The the where I try to get to is certainly where I work with my companies is to create this customer-centric idea, and then the results, outcomes, and metrics are what I establish. That's that's our our measuring stick, if you will. But we have to get the culture right. We have to get the leaders right. The people. From that point, then we can really make it uh, make a business rock. So I want to get into a little bit of a cultural idea as well. So I'm going to read these slides to you. So forgive me for just reading the slides, but I, I want to first of all say is culture is neutral. There, it's it could be good, it could be bad. It doesn't matter. It's just a neutral statement. Culture is a neutral statement. The culture that you have is one you've created, nurtured, made manifest. And again, I work with tons of businesses. I've got a lot of clients right now, and we're working on some of these things as I speak. It came out of very large organizations. And I, one of the first things I realized is, wait a minute, I, I am the culture. And when I ran a very large organization, our, our gross revenue per annum was $800 million a year. I had a national team. And what I realized early on was, and this is many years ago, is that I am, like it or not, the parental figure of how em people emulate my business, the business, et cetera. I realized, wait a minute, I'm the culture. I am the guy that's establishing how the culture feels around here. It was kind of an eye opener. So just to keep in mind, the culture you have is one you've created, nurtured, and made manifest. The second part of that, the culture and the organization will prosper to the degree of the capa uh, capability, commitment, and caring of those who comprise it. So now we're getting out of the neutral statements and into more of something that um, uh, where I love to live is to understand what is the degree of the capability, commitment, and caring of those who comprise my organization, thereby my culture. So food for thought, we can come back to it if you wish, but I just want to illustrate some of the things that I've learned over the I dare say many, many decades. And then the last one, the prevailing culture will attract those who naturally gravitate to a like culture. Those that, and it's kind of interesting, uh, when you think about hiring is those that come to typically a culture often uh, attract those like people. It's the um, uh, birds of a feather flocking together idea. So. It's, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. I've seen it work uh, over the years, and um, this is where we have to be very careful of what our culture is and who, who we're attracting and why we're attracting those, those people as well. So I, I want to get into maybe your part of the show here, and, and some of it is when I think of how we start to center our organization, you know, everything sort of revolves, in my opinion, around how do we prepare thy soil? How do we get our foundation for our organization really right, which is the culture? You know, foundation is the cultural piece. And, and if I can, I'm just going to give you a quick uh, definition out of the dictionaries. A culture is a shared belief and value of a group, the beliefs, customs, practices, and social behavior of a particular nation or people. Let's, let's call it a tribe. And it when I, I break it down a little bit more and I see it as the personality of the business, or, or even better yet, what's the spirit of the business? How does it feel? Now, you know, this is the point where people say, well, that sounds really good, but what, what will this cultural thing do for me? And, and here's, here's kind of the, 
what I call culture at work. Over the years, I've determined, or at least certainly um, uh, through my education, what I teach is um, uh, culture at work is really, it's about revenue. It's how, how do we attract the right customers to our revenue? Are we, are we a value play in our culture or are we a price play? Are we, uh, let's say, a Walmart versus a Nordstrom? Are we, where do we fall in that? It's attracting the right culture uh, of cus customers to our culture. Um, we, once we attract those customers, patients, what have you, we keep those by providing and continuing to provide value, which is quality or quantity. You know, there are people that are just quantity oriented and they, they turn people and products and they are typically low margin and high volume and they do, they can make money. But it's, what I'm trying to get to is what's the value? Why, what is the value that you bring from a cultural perspective? And then, of course, one thing I want everyone to, to think about in this process is reputational capital. What is the branding that you have around your culture? What does it mean to others that may want to work in your, your uh, organization or even attract it to your organization? So in the long run, it's, it saves money by attracting highly capable workforce, what we call employer of choice. It's those people that you read about when you hear of the best places to work, uh, those are the folks that you hear about when it talks about saving money by attracting a highly capable workforce. Mitigates uh, and reduces recruitment costs. I don't think Apple or Google or perhaps even Zappos spend a lot of money on recruitment. People want to work there and they gravitate to that culture. It also improves employee retention and it has a very high dollar, high impact ROI because of the quality of work that typically comes out of a high quality culture. So with that, I want to give you a couple of examples. And it, when I go through this, I want, the word I want you to think about is branding. And I, what that means is how are you known from a cultural perspective? What, what do people think of you? So I want to start my first example with what I call a belief system and a cultural component. And I'm sorry for the long uh, paragraph here, but I'm going to read it really quickly. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can't quote them, disagree with them, glorify them. I'm sorry, you can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them about the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward, and while some see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Does that feel like a belief statement or a cultural statement? Do you think that people that would go to work for Apple might be a part of this statement and resonate with this? So this is what I call a belief. And when I think of branding, Apple's done a great job from a branding perspective. And if you're in the technology business, there's a good chance that you might want to go to work for Apple. So um, hopefully there's a correlation that you see. Our culture from Apple relates to those that we hire or gravitate to us. But statements like this are somewhat of a belief statement that that is my culture. This is where I belong and this is where I want to be. Does Apple pay more than anyone else? No, they do not. Matter of fact, they're, they, they do have parity with the other tech companies, but they don't pay any more than anywhere else anyone else. They, they have this mantra and people want to work there. The second one I want to illustrate is what I call an organizational strategy culture. And what we look at from a mission standpoint, and I'll tell you a really quick story here. This is a fun story. I walked into and I used to work with this very large trucking company out of San Francisco. And behind the receptionist desk, there was this acronym. And of course, the question is, well, what in the world does this stand for? What is ETDBW? And, and I obviously begs the question. So the answer is easy to do business with. I thought, oh, that makes perfect sense. Well, the more I got to thinking about this and the more I drilled into this was they had built their entire culture and how they perform their work and how they deal with customers and how they deal with each other around this cultural statement of we need to be easy to do business with, not only internally, but in our community, community being customers, the marketplace that they serve, et cetera. I thought, you know, it's absolutely brilliant. So here we have this 
uh, hopefully you, you see the dichotomy of one is sort of a belief statement, one is a strategic goal. And by the way, they did away with mission statements. This was the mission statement. This is what we do. This is what we believe. This is our culture. So I want to get out your I want you to get out your pens and paper because I got a lot of questions to ask you. And here we go. This is going to be about you from this point forward. So the first one is I want to and talk about a showstopper. This is the most amazing question I ask people is what's your exit strategy when I talk to business owners? And, and of course, the question is, what does that have to do with culture? Well, I'm going to explain it, so bear with me. The cultural piece is, if we're going to build a legacy within our organization, and we're going to pass this on to our children, or we're going to sell this company that we have, the company that we have built and that we run is maybe an investment, and we're building equity in it, and that's going to be our retirement. That's great, but what is the... What is the culture and the legacy that you will leave that will keep this business in prosperity? Who are the people that you've hired that are going to take your place and those that are with you today? And maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's five years, maybe it's 20 years. But how are we building the culture to ensure that when you're ready to leave the business, the legacy that you leave is the one that you absolutely chose to leave on? How did you get your business on your terms? So how do we blueprint that to success? How do we do that? And that's the that's the big question for us to think about when is your exit strategy? Now those people and I this is a this is a tough question. I, I understand it and I it's usually a stumper when I ask my business people, the people I work with, what is your exit strategy? But we have to build all the infrastructure, all the culture, the people, the leadership around this model of I'm leaving in five years and we have to figure out how to do this. Five years is a very, very short window. So how do we do that? And we, we begin with culture. What is your culture like? If your company is going to be acquired and you're going to build equity and you're going to get a better multiple than the, your competitor, you got to figure out how have I constructed my infrastructure? Is there a good culture? Do people want to work here? What's my turnover ratio? What's my customer churn ratio? What's my patient churn ratio? So on and so on. So it, think about this. What is your exit strategy? So write it down. What is your exit strategy? And, and by the way, I, I want to give you the two-week rule between being a manager and owning a job within your business or actually being a leader who can actually uh, eventually sell the business. So here's the two-week rule that I use. So I ask my business people that I work with, my clients, I say, can you take two weeks off? Go sit on a beach somewhere, no telephone, no computer, no iPad, no nothing. Can you sit on a beach for two weeks and come back and have the business running, if not better than when you left it? Can you do that? The answer is no. You're probably managing your business. You may want to think about how do I get into a leader, leadership position. The answer is yes. You probably build an infrastructure that's rock solid that's going to go. That, that is a radically successful business. And now, like we've talked about with the EMF, you have your business on your terms. The business is working for you, not the other way around. The next part I want to illustrate here is what's your vision? When Tom Watson built IBM, it's a fascinating story. He didn't go in with what existed or what have I seen from another company. He created IBM around what his vision was for it, and he built the organization to fit the vision. I love this. There was no morphing necessarily. It grew, but it grew on his terms of how he'd like to see the thing go. So what is your vision? So I can get into a little bit of idea, too, about shared values of the vision. Is that part of what you do? What is the vision for your organization? How will it feel? How does it work? How do people relate to themselves? What are you going to do in the future? What's your five-year plan? What are your non-negotiables as far as what you need in your vision? What do those what do those look like? We we have a statement around here. It's it's called pain pushes until vision pulls. Pain is the day-to-day -day grind that we're in, that we're just trying to make a buck. When we finally get to the point where, wait a minute, let's get visionary and let's figure out where we're going as an organization. So what's your personal vision? A couple of things I'd love to ask you as well at this point. What's your vision for your business and for yourself? So if, if you 
live your life like you run your business. What is, what is the vision that you can change? What's what can you do to make your your vision more succinct to to your mission statement, your value proposition? What do those things look like? The other question, so you know, I want you to, I'd love for you to think about these questions. When will you, your vision be realized? If that's your vision, then when are you going to have this? When are you going to know when you're there? How will you know? How will you know when you achieved your vision? So it's these things to think about where you're going with your your organization, not only yourself, but your your company. Here's another aha that I get a lot of, and this is number three here, my questions to you. My little statement goes, an organization begins to decay the moment it ceases self-evaluation. So what is, what is you oriented, when is the last time you did a cultural audit? When is the last time you went out and met your top 10 clients or your, your patients or your customers? What do those clients look like? Who are they? What's the demographic, psychographic of the buyers? What's your trade area? What's your geographical trade area? If you have an office in a, in a specific city, what does your trade look, area look like and how many people belong from the demographic or psychographic component fit within your trade area? Do you have to expand that? What's your marketing plan? It's all these ideas about the organization. If, if we don't keep our eye on it and where we've been and where we're going and do the, let's call the assessment piece I was talking about, how do we know where we are and how do we know where we're going or when we get there, how will we know? I love the idea of, for example, secret shoppers. And just as I was saying about walking into the retail stores I used to walk into and I knew what kind of experience I was going to get, and I was pretty much right on what that experience was going to be like. What is that experience like for people coming into your office or your building or engaging your people or having something to do with your business. What does that feel like? And so if we don't go outside to look in, I'm not sure we're ever going to know what our organization looks like or feels like, or is it a good fit for us? The, the other part, when I, when I think about a lot of this, is asking the questions of what is the general description of your target customer? What's the age, income, family status, occupation, net worth, attitudes, key behaviors? What do those things look like if we don't know what our organization is able to deliver on, what our capability is, or what our cap capacity is to deliver on that promise? Really quick, and I'll tell you another really quick story here. Bain and Company, one of the preeminent consultancy groups, did a survey a number of years ago. They went out and asked 30, 362 businesses, and they asked this question of them. Do you deliver customer excellence to 362 businesses? Of that 362 businesses, 80% of those said, yes, we deliver ex exceptional customer value. Then they went out and asked the customers of those, of those 362 companies. And the question was, do you get superior value? Do you get a customer service excellence from that company, and 7% of those people said, yes, we actually get a wonderful customer experience from that 362, uh, those 362 companies. So interesting disconnect. The question is, are we fooling ourselves about our organization? And I'm going to say, according to Bain Company, absolutely. We don't know exactly where our organization is or what we're all about with our consumers and what we're doing out in the marketplace. Number four of my little bullets here on the questions. When I think about an organization, one of the first things that comes to mind, if you can call it our little diagram, is people. And any organization, within any organization, you're only as good as those you surround yourself with. So like it or not, a business is an ecosystem. You're only as good as those people you bring into your organization. So here's the question. Do you hire to culture? So once you establish your culture, you know what it is. So Apple, for example, or Google. So there's a, even a book out now that says, are you, are you smart enough to work at Google? I think it is. It's the point of, it's, it's a test. It's an, an amazing test because they only take X amount of people because so many people want to work there that they only take so many. So do you think Google 
is one of those that is really concerned about the culture they have? I'm going to say absolutely. So when you look at your organization, your ecosystem, do you hire to fit that ecosystem? Do you hire attitude or do you hire skill? And I would encourage you to hire attitude because we can teach them the skills. That's the, the great part. But the attitude is the second component of that. And then here's just one quick little trick that, I, that I've used. Or is, and, and this is just one small thing that I've done. It's been very successful in the past. But if you think about giving somebody a job description, it's telling them a job. It, so you're a worker, I'm a guy, I'm a manager, you're a worker. So go do your job and, and shut up and don't bug me. That's, that's what a job description sounds like to me. If I turned around and said to a person I was going to hire, we'd like you to read your position agreement. This is your position, this is how we see it, and do we agree? Is this work for you? Because this is what needs to work for us. So have you formed a partnership as opposed to telling somebody about a job? The idea is how do we partner with our people? If we're only as good as those we surround ourselves with, how do we get the best and the brightest to come work with us? A few things I want to tell you about that I would love for you to look up. I'm not going to touch them here because we're going to run out of time. And besides, it's just something you can do on your own. I would love for you to look up employer of choice, employer of choice, the learning organization. By the way, that's Peter Senge, S-E-N-G-E, Peter Senge. And then I would love for you to think about creating your own corporate university. There's a, a great quote that I love to use. I think it was Zig Ziglar or some crazy guy. The only thing worse than training employees and losing them is not training them and keep them. So the only thing worse of not training employees, keeping them, and not having that, that um, mind share, if you will, to impart the wisdom and the knowledge of of how the business works. So I, I encourage you to think about your own corporate university. And yes, you can do it. It's not at, uh, very expensive at all. OK, so here's the, the next one. And collectively, it looks like my wife fell off in the conversion here. Collectively, you're only as good as your last customer and patient interaction. This is kind of where I was getting back to is how do you know? This is the Bain & Company idea of one company says we deliver excellent value and the people receiving that excellent value say, no, you don't. How do we know what our last customer or patient interaction was within our organization? How do we become patient-centric or client-centric? How do we do that? And of course, it is to get everyone in line with what's our priority here. I mentioned aligning organizational energy. All the organizational energy that you can possess should be directed right at this thing itself, at the customer level. Now, there's, there's a couple of things that uh, you might want to think about. Some people are in the quality play. So it's basically higher price, uh, better performance, excellent service, et cetera. Some people are in the price play. So it's, again, the high margin, oh, excuse me, low margin, high volume turnover. That's, that's great. So the idea, when I think of hotels, are you a Best Western or are you a Ritz Carlton? Someone where and there, you have to figure out who is my target market how do I best get to them? And then how do I nurture and grow that relationship? Unfortunately, this is an everyday thing. So, uh, and then the last bullet I want to bring up is really about leadership. And I am so big on leadership and I want to pop the bubble on leadership as well. And that's the bursting bubble on the right side. And I want everyone on the line to think about transformational leadership. And, and I'll tell you a really quick story about my my last job, which, as I mentioned, I was a vice president of a very large company, ran a very large organization. And what that gave me are these things. It gave me power, command, control, prestige, had all these things. And what I realized later, after I left the organization, those things had nothing to do with leadership. I was a manager. And, and maybe perhaps not even a very good one, because that power, control, are in prestige are really the, the um, they're not the same with the transformation leadership. So it's, it's, this is about walking the talk and being authentic and understanding how we grow our people. And we don't grow our people by telling them what to do. We grow our people by being um, open to ideas and to um, what I love to say is about leaders, 
I think leaders, the best, the greatest leaders on earth are the biggest losers. They've lost their ego. They've lost their will to be right. They've uh, uh, lost the idea that they have to tell everybody what to do because they've hired great people. They should allow them to do their job. And, and I would love for people to think about this. Leaders, the great leaders are greatest losers. And I'm thinking of all the things, such as the ego and, and the other things, all the trappings and the things that we need. They're just not that important. And one thing I want, I want to stress as well is great leaders are really lazy, and they should be. Great leaders should be really lazy. And there's a correlation. The busier the leader is, probably the lower they are in the food chain, meaning that a leader's job is to get visionary, to get out in front of the organization, understand where we're going, not being the technician within the organization. So lazy, meaning let the people I've hired do their job, and I'm going to hire really good people um, and I'm going to let them go and let them have their um, and give them their, their reins, if you will, because that's why I hired them. So to me, transformation leaders, we don't dictate culture and values. We live, we are the embodiment of those cultures and values. So I want to get into my biggest challenge with doing the coaching or creating uh, these dynamic cultures and organizations in Here's, here's my story, and I'll tell you how they de domesticate elephants. And by the way, I'm a huge elephant fan. I love these things. It's the, they take an elephant at a very young age, and they put a very large chain on that very small leg, and they chain the elephant to a post. And the elephant learns that it's tethered to the post. Over time, as the elephant grows, they can virtually tie a very, very small rope onto an adult elephant's leg. And the elephant still thinks they're tethered and they can't move. So they, the elephant will stay with this very small rope which could break just instantaneously. It means nothing to the elephant except that it believes it's tethered. So the, the biggest challenge I have from helping my clients sort of get out of their own way is, is to get maybe out of, understand what they're tethered to, meaning that there are some that it just it makes me a little crazy because they're the willingness to live in mediocrity, to, to live at, in a moment of what is as opposed to what can be. And, and so my goal is to try and figure out why do people feel like they're tethered to the things that they've done all through their lives of the business career. And I, my job is to break the mold and to get people out of where they are and get them on to where they can get to. And, my confession is I have a coach. I have a coach that I work with. And the reason is, is I'm, I don't know everything. And the other reason is they help me find my blind spots. And they call them blind spots for a reason. So it's the idea of how can you maybe think about not being the Lone Ranger and figure out where can I get help and who can help me with my blind spots. It, it, it's a challenge. It's kind of interesting. Anybody has any ideas, I'd love to love to hear it. But my biggest challenge is to get people out of their comfort zone and into things that make life not only more worthwhile and interesting, but also kind of get into that mode of how can I create this crazy business that's so successful we can't stand ourselves. That's a challenge. Again, we love your input. So I want to give you some ideas, and this is actually one of my favorite quotes. I use this on almost every presentation I give, and it's the best way to, to predict the future is to create it. And I, I'm a Peter Drucker fan, and we in the management world love it. And I, but I want to give you some, some thoughts. In 1900, human knowledge doubled every 100 years. So if you think of yourself in the year 1900, every 100 years, knowledge would double. In 1945, it was every 25 years. In 2014, it's become every 13 months. And they predict by 2020, it's going to be every 12 hours. 65% of grad schools today will have jobs in the future that, that do not exist yet. The Department of Labor says that workers will have between 10 and 14 jobs by the age of 38. And I love this statistic, 1.3 billion Facebook users. It'd be the second largest company country in the world. 5.9 billion Google searches a day, 2.4 million YouTube uploads in the time I've just mentioned this to you. 
And 90% of the world's tech data has been generated in the last two years. 90% of the world's tech data has been generated in the last two years. We, we live in really interesting times. And some of the um, things we have to prepare for is how do we how do we create our own future? So how do we muddle through the the what I call infobesity? We have so much information at our disposal. How do we get through this process and learn and, and really stick to our guns about what kind of culture we're going to have and what information me means to us and, and how we can grow through this information uh, overload. And, you know, I've come up with three different ideas, what I consider three keys to success. And it's really our ability to learn, unlearn, and synthesize information of value. Value is the operative word there. Our ability to quickly adapt to rapidly changing conditions. This is the nimbleness that we have to have in an organization. And, and one thing I find really interesting these days is our attitude towards ourselves and others. And why I was trying to cite some of these statistics is we have a changing work environment and it changes continually. And will become even more so as, as we go forward. So in predicting the future, how do we take into account not only a changing workforce, this information overload, and how do we design our own and create our own future? Which brings me to the next point. When you have some, when you want something you've never had, you have to do something you've never done. And, you know, it's, it's hard to do. And, and this is the part that I know that some people need help to get through this or, or get it done from a, a perspective of here we are now, but we want to be here in the future. And it's hard. It's, there's a lot of moving parts, but it can be done. But we have to alter our way of thinking and how we thought in the past is not going to be uh, germane to where we're trying to go in the future. Uh, a great coach who I follow is Marshall Goldsmith, who has a book out. It's what got you here won't get you there. Today is different. In the next five years, we have such an amazing change in the environment. And if you're not ready for it, you're, you're going to get run over, unfortunately. And, and we all have to think about this. So, so let me tell you a little bit, and I'm going to kind of wrap this up because I do want to open up to Q&A, is just some thoughts, you know, and we know this and we've gone through this, is manage things and lead people. So things can be managed, and it's, it's and frankly, management is the easiest part of our job. Leading people is the hardest job I've ever had to perform because it makes me, I have to think. I can't just use systems to make people do things. It's basically, I have to think about how do I get people enrolled, engaged, re-energized, and it's a hard job. So in order to prepare that, so I think it's the, the culture in the workplace can be the ecosystem or it can be a battlefield. It can be chaos or collaboration, but we have to choose. It's your choice. I will tell you also, cultures are contagious. Uh, bad culture is as contagious as a good culture and vice versa. The good news, bad news, we have to transform our, for ourselves first to be great leaders. We can't expect others to look at us and say, oh, gee, what a great leader. We have to prove ourselves. We have to be that before people are going to follow us. So here's one of my really scientific statements. Happy people create happy customers. It's amazing how that works. Uh, scary simple, but again, a little tougher to implement. We're only as good as those we surround ourselves with, and we're only as good as our last patient or customer interaction. So we're thoughts to, to ponder. And of course, I always consider this is sort of the bridge to success to get through this process. This is my contact information. And be, by the way, I know Kayla wants to wrap it up and open up to questions. Before we do, I want to tell you that I'm happy. If you want to call me, write this email down, go to my website. I will provide those on the call a one hour free coaching session. And yes, I will do that for free. And you don't have to pay me a dime, nor do you have to sign up or do it. Well, you do have to let me know if you want to do it. Uh, but and if you like what we do, great. If you don't, that's all right, too. And one other thing through EMIT, I have, and I can offer it up to you, is a, I'm going to read this real quick, it's called a foundations, foundations program, free forever, no credit card required, uh, 21 foundation classes, 35 hours of videos, and it's all in how to create a screamingly successful business. Those are free as well, but you do have to let me know uh, because I am... Um, I'm not going to spam you. You have to tell me if you want this thing. If you want the 
the foundations thing from EMIF, and, and again, it's all free. There's no obligation, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, I want to well, I want to thank you for listening to me. I'm about out of breath. I would love to answer questions and um, and uh, feel better. So fire away if you would. And Kayla, did you have another slide? Should I advance this? I do. Yeah, yeah great. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually going to hand it off to our CEO here, uh, Ron King. He's been um, keeping track of our questions, and, and he'll uh, fire them away at you. So take it over, Ron. Well, thanks, Kayla. And Steve, nice thoughts here. To uh, Thanks very much. It's lots to think about here. Um, a question that I would have um, and has been um, posed here as well and that is, uh, Steve, you work in healthcare among numerous in industries. And can you tell us a little bit what do you see as the big difference between healthcare and other places, especially in terms of what are the traits of a healthy cult culture? It seems like it's fairly obvious when you go to an environment like Walmart or um, you know a car dealership or some something like that. But in a, a medical practice, everybody's kind of got his, his or her head down just trying to get the patients through there. Can, can you give us some ideas of what might be the signs of a healthy culture in a medical practice? No, that's a great question, Ron. You know, and I think, um, so I, I'm, I'm going to jump back maybe to some of the experiences, you know, certainly that I've had. And the, the culture itself is, is kind of interesting. And, and one of those is, so you have you have the physical presence of the office, and some of the culture pieces can leak through. How do you set appointments? Yeah, this is it might sound sound kind of silly, but how do you set appointments? Is it convenient to my customers or my patients? And if so, do I respond to those customers, patients within an hour, you know, two hours? One, you know, it's, there's no magic numbers. What is my promise to my clients and to my customers and my patients? So the cultural piece can be as um, as slight and let's call it nuance as as that. So here, and I'll tell you, I had a, a great student. He's actually a medical doctor. He's gotten his MBA, and then he took my program. I was his capstone advisor, and it was really interesting because he was telling me I can have a patient come into my clinic, and the coffee can be cold, and all hell breaks loose. Excuse my language. All hell breaks loose, and they're a dissatisfied customer. So when you think of the cultural component, it is it's huge, Ron, and it, it's almost like um, that seems like the tail wagging the dog. But isn't that interesting that the coffee is cold, so he has a dissatisfied customer? So what's the cultural component that one needs to ensure that you know it, it's really hard to do? But you know, the coffee's warm. We respond to our patients within a certain period of time. When they walk into my office, people are happy, and and I don't mean pretend happy, I mean actually happy, and, and they're capable. And now, and I'm going to back up one other step and say, <clears throat> a lot of this is how we go about our recruiting as well. And if we think, oh, gee, I, I need warm bodies to warm seats and answer a phone, I'm not sure that's going to be the best culture if, if you're following my logic. So how do we get um, people that are highly productive we don't necessarily have to pay them more, but we still have to create a culture like you would in any business. Does, does well, that was another one it? of our that that was another one of our questions here was when you're interviewing for a new staff, how do you know they're going to be a good fit with your culture? You know that that's actually I love that one. We uh, um, I would encourage anyone on the on the line that's looking at new employees is is to employ assessment tools and. You know, I, I personally, I do a little in the assessment world, but I would recommend there are some assessments that, from a predictive analysis perspective, that you can get really close on cultural fit. Not only cultural fit, but also um, capacity fit and capability fit. So, it, and I'm going to encourage people to do this. It's um, these these programs could be between I don't know, two hundred, three hundred dollars. But what you're going to save on turnover, I'm not turnover necessarily, but turnover cost, it dwarfs that. It, it's maybe one half of 1% of, of any cost in a recruitment perspective. Very inexpensive to do this when you think of the uh, in the big picture. So, so there are those 
those components, but I want to back up one second as well, Lana, and let you know, if we don't know what our culture is, if we haven't taken the time to do our own internal set, uh, assessment, do a cultural audit, where are we now? You know, what do you believe? What's your core values? Why are you here? Uh, get out of the cliches, if you will, and actually figure out, we personally, the people are running the organization, what are, what values do we own? And, and those values come through from a cultural perspective. We are the business, and you know we have to ensure that we, from a cultural perspective, own that. The and then hire to that. So, step one: figure out what your cultural culture is. If it's not what you think it, you want it to be, step one: before you start hiring people, figure out what it should be, and then find those people that will fit that culture. That raises another question that someone asked, and that is, when you've decided what your culture wants to be, how do you do that? How do you affect it without having a complete reorganization? Well, or do you need a complete yeah. reorganization? You know, I have to say, you've got to dare to rebuild your team sometimes. And, and what I also tell people, once you get your culture to a point where you really like it, you have to be a bulldog about keeping that culture as it is. And, and yes, it will morph, it will change, uh, but I will tell you my experience is once you establish that, once you know what your culture needs to be like where people are collaborative and they have a sense of ownership, and when I say ownership, I mean owning their job. You know, one, one point I want to really illustrate as well is that when we are employee-employer, when we have that relationship, if we think culturally, we're a partnership. How do we work together collectively? And you know, we, we want to start there. Now, if we get people that don't want to work in that environment that we've created, that we we feel is best for us for the vision of our organization, where we want to go, we've got to protect that like a bulldog, and and we have to dare to rebuild that team to um, lose those that frankly aren't willing to do it. And it, it doesn't make them bad people. That's the one thing. It, it just means that our culture won't fit you. And that's okay. And um, anyway, I'm sorry. I'm, I, don't, I don't mean to go off, but man, you're asking some really... Can well, let's you, move on to another question then. I, I do have some other questions here, and I want to try to get as many in as possible. We've got just about four or five minutes left. So we'll try to make these quick ones. Uh, one question was asked, do you have any kind of a questionnaire or template for conducting a cultural audit? This is something you've men mentioned several times. You want to really know what your constituents are thinking. And in this case, how would a medical practice uh, you know, go about asking some of their patients and referral sources as well, referring physicians, for example? Um, and what kind of questions would they ask in this kind of a cultural audit? And might this be something, by the way, that we might be able to follow up with our attendees today with with perhaps some additional information. Absolutely, Ron. You know, I have got a cultural audit that I have used, It's in, and I'd be happy to as well, and if anybody wrote my contact stuff, if they want to ping me or I can send this to you as well, Ron, and you can distribute, but there, I have a two or three page cultural audit that is really simple. It's so simple, it's scary. And, it is, and no, it's not hugely scientific, but it, it would give you a good flavor for where you are currently. And I, I would encourage anybody, you know, take a run at it and say, uh, and use this tool. If somebody wants to get sophisticated and really sophisticated and understand then how this thing will morph over time. Now, let me tell you one thing, and I, I'm going to caution everybody now that I've said that, is a code, any type of audit you cannot do just once. And so I'm I would encourage anyone, if you feel like you want to do an audit, terrific. Uh, the first audit you got to think of is your benchmark. So you got to set the ground level. What what is what is it now? And then in six months you want to do it again, or yeah, six months is about right for a cultural audit. Or perhaps I don't know if you want to wait a year because it won't give you much of a reading. Take take the the temperature, and then in six months do it again and see if you've made any progress. So and let me give the audience one really quick. This, this is so simple and silly. Get a few people within your organization. Take them out to lunch. And by the way, the corporate executives I work with, I say, take your people out to lunch. Get to know them. Here's the question you want to ask. So you with, you're having lunch, and you look at your person and say, you know, I really want to know your opinion, et cetera. 
I would like to know on a scale of one to 10, how do you feel our culture is? And it doesn't matter what they say, and hopefully it's a candid conversation, but they say, let's just say they, they say it's a seven. And then the next question is, well, how do we make it a 10? So it, it and um, I stole that from Jack Canfield, if anybody knows Jack Canfield. So where do we stack up? Give me a rating, one to 10, and then how do we get there? How do we, and, and now what you're doing is you're giving that, other human being across the table or what have you, kind of a say in how would you develop the culture? Now all of a sudden you, you start to get some ownership. Okay, Steve, I'm going to need to jump in there. We have just a minute or two left. Uh, why don't you and I work together to make this template available to everyone in the call today? We will send out a notice to everyone who enrolled for today's call on how to get that information. And I do want to thank you for a, a terrific presentation. Lots to think about here. Everyone who registered for this webinar, you will get an email with access to the recording of it, um, of the presentation, on our website. And you'll have access to that for a while to come. I uh, would like to ask you also to take a survey following the webinar and sign up for um, our newsletter to learn more about our upcoming webinars. And I want to talk a, about, a bit about the next one because I'm very excited about it. It will be presented by Dr. Neil Baum, who is a very well-known urologist in New Orleans. And he's written seven books on the business of medicine and on healthcare branding. And he's going to share his strategies for filling providers' calendars, making patients and referral physicians happy, building staff morale, and minimizing legal and clinical problems all through branding a medical practice from the inside out. So I think it's a perfect complement to, to Steve's presentation today. And Steve, I want to thank you again. And uh, last word goes to you, Steve. Well, I, I just want to say thank you to everybody. And again, I just want to go back and for, I want to commend you, Ron, for doing this for your clients. This is fabulous. And, and I not, you know, I think people ask have to ask how many people, how many of our vendors or what have you do these kind of things for us. So number one, kudos to you. And then number two, kudos for those people that get on the line to learn something. And and I'm, I'm really hoping that and part of my job is to ask more questions than answers and have people think about what their what their next steps are. And I'm happy to help in any way I can, but kudos to you for stepping out of your mundane, if you will, or just getting out of the ordinary and getting, jumping on a call and saying, yeah, maybe I can pick something up here. And um, and for that, you should be, here's a, a verbal slap on the back to you for doing it. So thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. We appreciate it very much. And the next webinar in the Pathways to Prosperity series will be July 9th. That's a Thursday at the same time, July 9th for Dr. Neil Baum. Thank you, everybody.